Paxos is one of the most fundamental distributed algorithms. It is important from the theoretical perspective because it gathers many fundamental ideas in distributed computing, but it's also important from the practical perspective because it's widely deployed today. Paxos was described by Leslie Lamport. It was described in his paper entitled The Part-Time Parliament. And Lamport described the paper by analogy to the way the parliament of the Greek island of Paxos used to work. The algorithm has been considered very difficult to understand, and many papers have been written to explain the algorithm. In fact, if we spend some time understanding the problem and the underlying assumptions, then it's relatively easy to understand the main algorithmic ideas behind Paxos, especially if we omit implementation details and optimization. And this is what I'm going to do now. The problem solved by Paxos is that of building a reliable computing system out of unreliable components. To illustrate this, assume we want to build a reliable banking computing system. So we have a server S that implements some bank accounts and clients can access these bank accounts, let's say, through the internet. So clients invoke operation through the internet on this server implementing the bank account and the server replies. If this is an important service that we would like to see functioning 24 hours, then we better make sure that this server doesn't fail. We can put it on a very reliable and robust machine, but even there, the probability that it fails is not nil. So what people do typically is to replicate this server and have, and have it implemented on several processes. So instead of having one process or one machine implementing the bank account, we will have several. For the sake of this presentation, let's assume we have two. So intuitively, by putting the bank account on two servers that are supposed to fail independently, we decrease, we divide by two the probability that the service is unavailable. But by doing so, we introduce also uh, a complication. The complication comes from the fact that now the requests of the client need somehow to go to both servers and we need to make sure that this server act as a single replica. So from the client perspective, everything should happen as if there was a single one, but of course a single one that is more available than a single replica that would fail on a single machine. Let's illustrate the problem on a simple case. Assume the initial value of the bank account is $100. And C1 asks to add $100 in the bank account. And C1 sends its request to the replicas of the service. Assume C2 sends a message saying, I would like to add 10% to the account. What might happen here if these messages arrive in different orders, and if they are immediately executed by these replicas, is that we can end up with inconsistency. So let's see what could happen to explain what this inconsistency would mean. So assume S1 receives the plus 100, then S2 receives the plus 10%, and then S2 receives the plus 100, and then S1 receives the plus 10%. So in this case, S1 will reply by saying, okay, the new balance of the account is plus 200, and here S2 will reply by saying the value is 100 and 10, plus 10%. Later on, the message from C2 will reach S1, and the message from C1 will reach S2. So what happened here is that the value of the account as seen by C1 is 200, and the value as seen by C2 is 110. Remember that the goal is to increase the availability while still ensuring the semantics of a single replica. So can this be a reasonable, can this be a semantic of a single replica? Well, it cannot, because if there was a single service, then the values we will see, then the values we will see would be either 200 for C1 and 220 for C2, or 110 for C2 and 210 for C1. Indeed, if the request of C1 goes first, then this is what's going to happen. If the request of C2 goes first, this is what's going to happen. But we will never be able to see these values if 
there was a single service. So in a sense, the fact that we replicate introduced this problem of ordering. And if the services, if the replicas execute the messages in different orders, they violate the expected semantics of single replica. So roughly speaking, the idea here is to increase reliability or build a reliable computing system by replicating. By replicating the service that is supposed to be highly available. But this introduces a problem because from the client perspective, we still would like to guarantee the semantics of a single replica, but this could be violated if messages come in different orders and they are immediately executed by the services. So what the Paxos protocol does is actually execute some communication steps between the services such that instead of executing these requests or commands, as I, will, as I will call them in a minute, immediately it first executes some algorithm that will guarantee that the execution of these commands is totally ordered. So if these commands are, totally, are executed in a totally ordered way, then we will guarantee single replica semantics as long as the service is a deterministic state machine, which is what we are assuming here. If we look carefully, the problem really is for S1 and S2 to agree whether to execute C1 first or C2 first. If they achieve this, they will guarantee the ordering problem. So the problem of agreeing whether to execute C1 first or C2 first is called agreement or consensus. And this is actually the problem solved by the consensus protocol. So we can ignore the client and focus on this problem, which is S1 and S2 need to agree on whether to execute C1 or to execute C2. So the problem solved by the algorithm really is that of agreeing on a value. So we assume here that S1 has a value C1. We can even forget that this was a command coming from a client. S2 has a value C2. So these are two processes and they need to agree on which of these to execute, which of these to execute first and then which of these to execute second, etc. But let's focus on which of these to execute. The easier way of solving this problem is to rely on a leader. We can say that S1 is a leader, meaning that by default, S1 decides what to do. So if S1 is initially considered to be leader, then S1 will say C1 should be executed. So remember that the whole point is to tolerate the fact that, that these servers that I call also processes can crash. So what can happen here is that S1 can crash or S2 can crash. If both, of, if both of them crash, then the Paxos algorithm cannot do anything. The point is to tolerate the crash of at least one of them. So if S1 is the leader and S1 decides to execute C1 and then S1 crashes, then S2 should take over by somehow respecting the initial decision of S1. This means that S1 cannot decide C1 without informing S2 of its choice. An intuitive algorithm that comes to mind here is the algorithm that is called primary backup. The idea of the algorithm is very simple. S1 starts as being the leader. S1 decides what to do. So S1 has command C1. But before executing, I will model the fact of executing with this box with a cross. Before executing C1, S1 first informs S2 of its decision. The decision is to execute C1 and S2 will reply by saying, OK, I'm now aware of the fact that S1 wants to execute C1. Therefore, if S1 fails, S2 will take over knowing that C1 has been executed first. So S2 will first execute C1 and then eventually C2, etc. But remember of the possibility of crashes. There are two cases here that are of interest. One of them is if S2 crashes before responding to S1, then S1 should keep going. Remember, the goal is to tolerate this crash. Similarly, if S1 crashes, S2 should keep going. But how does a process knows that the other one has crashed? They know that by using a timeout. S2 is expecting to receive a message from S1. S1 is expecting to receive a message from S2. And they also know, which means that they, are, they have been programmed to know, that the duration of a message is at most delta, let's say one millisecond. 
if a message from S1 to S2 takes longer, then S2 times out S1 and declares S1 as being faulty and keeps going. Similarly, if S1 is expecting an OK from S2 and this OK takes more than delta, then S1 declares S2 have been faulty and then keeps going. In some systems, it's considered OK to rely on a timeout. But in others, this is not considered OK. As we all know, sometimes email takes several days to arrive because of some routing or failures in the network or whatever. In other words, sometimes messages take more than what we expect. So what happens here if messages take more than this delta? Consider the situation where S1 sends indeed its command to C1 and S1 doesn't hear back from S2. In the same vein, assume that S2 is expecting a message from S1 and didn't get anything. If we apply this primary backup algorithm as I sketched a minute ago, S1 will decide to execute C1, having declared S2 as faulty, and similarly, S2 will execute its command, which is C2, its initial value, having declared S1 faulty. So if the assumption that messages take at most delta is violated, consensus will be violated. In fact, the Paxos algorithm tries not only to tolerate the fact that processes crash, but also that the network is not synchronous. Roughly speaking, a network is synchronous if all messages take at most delta, where delta is some known bound. The primary backup algorithm that I described works well if processes can crash and the network is synchronous. If it's not synchronous, as I have just pointed out, this algorithm doesn't work. It violates consensus, therefore it will violate the ordering of commands and it will violate the single replica semantics. Before diving into the Paxos algorithm, let's have a closer look at what it means for a network not to be synchronous. It's obvious that if messages never reach their destinations, nothing is impossible. So we need to assume that there is some reliability in the network, and this is typically ensured by retransmission. What happens if we assume that indeed the network is, that the network is reliable, meaning that messages eventually arrive, but the network is also asynchronous. Asynchronous means that there is no delta. There is no bound on the time it takes for messages to reach their destination. In this case, the problem is impossible. The consensus problem is impossible. And there is a famous paper by Fisher, Lynch and Patterson in 85 that shows that this is impossible. This is described in many places. In fact, what's important here to notice is that the problem is impossible if even if we have 100, 1000 processes that need to reach consensus and we assume that only one of them can crash. So the problem is impossible if the system is asynchronous. The problem is possible if the system is synchronous. So what is between asynchronous and synchronous? There is an interesting model which makes a lot of sense in practice, which is to assume that indeed messages take delta most of the time. So sometimes they take longer, but the number of times messages take long longer is bounded. We don't know this bound, but this bound exists. So the meaning that three times or four times or five times messages take longer but there is a bound on the number of times messages take longer. This is a realistic assumption because it somehow means that usually the system is synchronous and sometimes messages take longer. We call this model the eventually synchronous model. This is a symbol for eventually, meaning that it could be, meaning that it might not be synchronous for some time, but then it becomes synchronous. Let's look a little bit here at the meaning of the eventually synchronous model. For simplicity, let's assume that these processes, they have clocks and these clocks are synchronized. So if we know that the system is eventually synchronized, then we can have the lead, we can have the processes work as follows. They could work in a round based manner and each round and, and the length of each round could be such that processes have enough time to exchange messages when the messages take delta. So in round one, S1 is leader. In round two, S2 is leader. In round three, S1 is leader, etc. The idea here is that a process is leader in a given round, tries to impose its decision, but if messages take longer, then we suspect S1 of having failed and we give a chance of, to S2. Similarly, S2 tries to impose its command. If it doesn't succeed, which means that 
messages take longer, we go back to S1, etc. The fact that we assume the system to be eventually synchronous means that we will reach around where messages will take less than delta and the leader will impose its decision. This is one basic idea underlying Paxos, but we are not there yet. And the reason why we are not there yet is the following difficulty. We know that there is a time after which the system is going to be synchronous and we want to tolerate crashes. The difficulty is the following. S1 is leader in round one, is not leader in round two, is leader in round three, etc. But for how long and S1 moves from a round to the other if, roughly speaking, it doesn't hear from S2 in this round. S2 moves from a round to the other if it doesn't hear from S1 in a round. But for how long shall they keep moving from one round to the other? They don't know the bound, because otherwise this would mean a synchronous system. So they don't know this bound, and they keep going. But for how long can they keep going? They cannot keep going forever, because remember that we want to build a highly available reliable computing system that eventually responds to the client. They cannot rely on the system to be eventually synchronous and expect to hear from the other leader. Why? Because the other leader can crash. So in fact, if we have two servers like in this picture and we want to tolerate the crash of one of them, assuming that the system is eventually synchronous, then the problem is impossible. The problem is impossible because the servers cannot keep forever expecting a reply from the other server because the other server might never respond. And they cannot rely on knowing that the delta will hold at a given point in time. They don't know this time. So the problem is impossible. Interestingly, the problem becomes possible if instead of having only two processes, we have three. We have three and we assume that only one of them can crash. Or more generally, we have n and we assume that n over 2 plus 1 cannot crash. The intuition is that a process that is leader in a given round might rely on at least another process to respond eventually. And this is crucial. So we have the notion of a leader and we have the assumption that at least one process will be able to reply when the system becomes synchronous. This is crucial because the other process that replies will play the role of a witness. And the key idea within Paxos is this idea of a leader plus the idea of a witness. And this is made possible because the assumption we make is that indeed processes can crash, but only a minority. And this is very important. In the case here, we have three processes. Only one of them is supposed to crash, meaning that if more than one is supposed to crash, then Paxos is not expected to do anything useful. I will come back to that actually because it's not completely true. To sum up, the problem solved by Paxos is that of reaching consensus. We have a set of processes. Each of them has some initial value. S1 has C1, S2 has C2, S3 has C3. They need to reach agreement. They need to decide of which one of them to execute. The assumption is that one of them can crash. Of course, we don't know which one in advance. And the second assumption about the network is that eventually there will be a round where they will have enough time to communicate. So now I will zoom into how the Paxos protocol uses this idea of the leader, more precisely the rotating leader, and the idea of a witness to guarantee consensus. So remember the idea of a rotating leader. We have a system of rounds and in every round there is exactly one leader. In round one, S1 is leader. In round two, S2 is leader. In round three, S3 is leader. In round four, S1 is leader, etc. So this is the first idea to remember. In every round, one leader tries to decide. In the very first round, S1 tries to decide to reach a decision, and it does so by consulting the other processes. So this is crucial, as we will see. The other processes in any given round play the role of witnesses. So they witness something. What they witness is that the leader would like to decide a value. So in this picture, I will, I will zoom on what happens in round R, any given round of the algorithm, because the algorithm, the Paxos algorithm, executes exactly the same protocol in every round. So I will zoom at what happens in round R. I will assume that S1 is the leader in this round. S2 and S3 play the role of witnesses. Of course, they are coming from round R, R they are coming from round R minus one and R minus two, etc. In such rounds, they have witnessed 
certain value that certain values could have been decided so when they come to round r they have a piece of data that is very important which is a value and a round number i will come back to this in a minute the paxos algorithm works as follows the first message is a message sent by s1 to the other processes and can be viewed as a plebiscite message basically s1 is saying i am the leader and i would like to test the water Testing the water means, roughly speaking, asking the witnesses what they have seen in previous rounds. The second message is a message by the witnesses to the leader and can be viewed as an allegiance message. They are basically telling the leader, okay, you are the leader and this is what we have seen in previous rounds. And I will come back to that in a second. So here, the leader receives these messages from the witnesses. What does it do? It receives pairs of value round. S2 tells S1 that it has seen this value in this round and S3 says it has seen another value in another round. So here there is a selection procedure where S1 selects the value that has been witnessed in the latest round, in the highest round. Something important to notice here is that S1 might also have been acting as a witness in previous rounds. So when I talk about selection, this means selecting the value that has been witnessed in latest rounds, either by S2, by S3, or by S1. So this is very important. Then S1 proposes this value selected to the witnesses. So I call this message P2 and the first plebiscite message P1. When they receive this message, the witnesses, S2 and S3, have to accept the value proposed by S1. And this is the act of witnessing. We can talk about acceptance of witnessing, but what is important is that at this very point, S2 and S3, and of course S1 itself, but this is by default because it's the leader, they are basically adopting, accepting the value V, which is the value selected here, and the round number where this has been witnessed. The round number is R. In subsequent rounds, what they have witnessed here and this round number will be the value and the round number they will send to the leader. When the leader receives these acceptance messages, the algorithm is over. It can decide. It decides what? It decides the value that it has selected here and which has been witnessed here. And this is the value that has been decided. These are the main steps of the algorithm in any given round. Plebiscite, allegiance, proposition acceptance decision of course this algorithm should work even if there are crashes more specifically even if there is one crash in this three case example and even if the system is not yet synchronous so if one of these in this particular case if one of the processes fail say for example s1 or s2 to simplify first then s1 can keep going so in fact when I say here that S1 is expecting messages from S2 and S3, it is expecting messages from at least one of them. Same thing here, it is expecting a message from at least one of them. So it receives, if it receives such a message from at least one of them, it decides. Of course, what can happen also is that S1 also crashes. If S1 also crashes, this means that S2 and S3 will not receive these messages from S1, and in that case, they will move to the next round. Remember that the idea is that the duration of a round is chosen such that messages are being communicated within some time bound that is considered reasonable. And if this is not respected, processes move to the next round. When they move to the next round, they ignore all messages that they may have received later from previous rounds. The most important thing to notice here is that if a value is decided, this means that it has been witnessed by at least another process than the leader. So if S1 has decided V, this means that either S2 has sent this message or S3 has sent this message. This is the crux of the safety of the algorithm. Any value that has been decided in a round has been witnessed by at least another process. Therefore, no other value V prime different than V could be decided in a high round. Why? Because by the construction of the algorithm, a value V prime that will be decided is a value that would have been selected here and the selection is made after getting at least another message after getting at least another message 
from another process. So at least one witness here is coming back from the previous round. This is the key to the safety of the algorithm. If a value is decided, it has been accepted and therefore it will be seen in the selection procedure of the next rounds. The liveness of the protocol follows from the fact that we assume that there is a round that we will reach where the leader will have enough time to communicate with the other processes. They won't time out the, process, they won't time out the leader and move to subsequent round. If we reach a round where the leader communicate with the processes like I suggested here, at least with one of them, it will reach a decision and reply to the clients, etc. There is something important to notice here, which is the following. Even, the system, even if the system is actually never synchronous, which means that we don't reach the time where the leader has enough, we don't reach this time where the leader communicate with the others, safety will not be violated. Why? Because the selection procedure, no matter what happens, always relies on consulting a witness. Similarly, if more than one process crash, the protocol might not terminate because here the leader is expecting at least another response, but the safety will not be ensured, meaning there won't be any value V prime that is decided different from a previously decided value V. So this is somehow a strength of the algorithm which ensures safety even if this, the assumption it's relying on, crash of a minority and eventual synchrony do not hold. In that case, only liveness is jeopardized. So to sum up, a value is decided by a leader in a round only if the leader made sure that at least another process has witnessed this value. This is some kind of a locking procedure because it means that the value has been seen by at least two processes, the leader itself and somebody else. This will make sure that in subsequent round, another leader who would like to decide the value will see this value V because of this selection procedure. And this selection procedure gathers the values that have been witnessed in previous rounds. This means this value V in previous rounds will be witnessed. To summarize, the Paxos algorithm seeks to implement a reliable computing system out of unreliable components. More specifically, it actually tries to solve, it tries to solve the ordering problem to guarantee that several replicas of the same service behave like a single one. As I pointed out, solving the ordering problem boils down to solving the consensus problem. The Paxos algorithm does that assuming a set of processes, the replicas, a minority of them can crash and they communicate in a way that is eventually synchronous. In practical terms, messages, they typically take some bound, but sometimes they take longer. The number of times they take longer is bounded. And the Paxos algorithm rely on the idea of a rotating leader and the witnesses, the idea of ratifying a decision by a majority. And this is the original idea of Lamport with his part-time parliament. Before concluding, few remarks are in order. One of them is about rounds. Two of them have to do with rounds. In fact, rounds do not need to have the same size. We can imagine a round one that is relatively short, round two that is bigger, round three that is bigger, etc. It's not important for the correctness of the algorithm that these rounds have the same size. From a practical perspective, this might make a lot of sense because remember that the goal is to reach the point where within a round processes have enough time to communicate. So increasing the size of the round makes a lot of sense. The second important observation has to do with the fact that processes do not need to be synchronized. To simplify, I assume that processes have synchronized clocks and they exactly at the same time move from one round to the other. In fact, this is not necessary. We can imagine that processes have indeed local clocks, but these clocks are not synchronized, which might mean that we can assume that process S1 can still be in round one, while process S3 has already moved to round R3. In fact, as I described it, the algorithm works exactly as is modulo one important thing, messages from previous rounds are ignored. So here, when we want to tolerate this asynchrony of the processes, when a process receives a message from an earlier round, it simply replies by saying, I'm in a subsequent round, you have to catch up. So if, for example, S1 still believes that it is leader here and is sending messages, whereas S3 has moved to round R3, 
If S1 sends a plebiscite message or a proposition message, S3 will simply say, I'm already in round three, you have to catch up. What is important is that eventually we reach a round where there will be only one leader and this leader will be able to communicate with the other. So rounds do not need to have the same size and rounds do not need to be synchronized or processes do not need to be synchronized. The algorithm works as is. The second main important observation has to do with the complexity of the algorithm or its efficiency. The Paxos algorithm is supposed to work when the system is eventually synchronous, but it is particularly efficient if the system is synchronous from the beginning, which means that messages take less than delta from the very beginning, which is a very reasonable assumption. We can choose delta such that messages take less than this delta in most of the time, meaning when the system is in a steady state, messages take less than delta. So in this case, remember, we assume that S1 is the first leader. If the system is synchronous from the very beginning, this means that everything will be over in the first round. In round R1, S1 will be able to communicate with the other witnesses and convince them of its choice and decide. In this particular first round, there is no need for this plebiscite and allegiance message. Remember that the goal here is to tell the leader of what happened in previous rounds. But there, were no, but there was no previous round. This is round one. So this can be removed. S1 proposes its command, receives acceptance and decides. Remember that we had some clients in the picture. After all, the goal of the replicated service was to give some replies to clients. In this case, after this proposal and this acceptance, S1 can immediately reply to a client which roughly speaking means there is only one round trip of communication between servers in order before replying to a client. This is considered practical. This is considered short enough for many applications. In fact, there are tons of optimization of Paxos. There is cheap Paxos, fast Paxos, vertical Paxos, multi-Paxos, Paxos in the beach, etc. All of them are basically optimizations of the main idea of rotating leaders and witnesses. I just presented here one of them, but there are many others. As I said earlier, the Paxos algorithm was written by Lamport in the late 80s. In the late 80s, there were also other people working in the same area. As I pointed out, the consensus problem was studied by Fisher, Lynch and Patterson in 85, who have shown that this problem is impossible if the system is asynchronous. In the late 80s, there were also a paper by Dwork, Lynch and Stockmeyer, which described an algorithm to solve consensus in eventually synchronous model, and the paper of Dwork, Lynch and Stockmeyer shares many similarities with the paper of Lamport and more specifically with the, using the ideas of leader and witnesses. There were also a paper by Liskov and Oki also in the late 80s and directly solving the consensus problem in the, the eventually synchronous model. All these papers came out around the same period and address similar problems. To conclude, the Paxos protocol solves the problem of building a reliable computing system by replicating the system over several replicas and ensuring the total ordering of clients' commands, which boils down to solving the consensus problem among the replicas. The Paxos protocol solves this problem assuming that processes can crash. More specifically, a minority of the processes can crash. In the illustrative example I considered, I assumed three processes. In fact, the, Praxo the Paxos protocol works for n processes as long as less than n minus n over 2 minus 1 can crash. A minority can crash. The very same algorithm generalizes to 5, 7, etc. The protocol assumes that the network is eventually synchronous, which corresponds to what is considered in practice as a reasonable model of computation, where timeouts are usually respected and sometimes violated. And the two main ideas used by Paxos are rotating leader or rotating coordinator and ratifying uh, the decision by witnesses or by a majority.